I have the um, I have a, a somewhat challenge here that we've got about whatever 45 minutes or so, and um, I'd like very much to address some of the things that are on your mind, because having been at the forefront of the solar industry for the last I guess 10 years or so, um, there's a lot of exciting things that I hope to share with you today. Um, so. Even though this is an engineering class, I think the first thing we do have to start off with is cost. And it looks like this is something that all of you are probably um, you know, knowledgeable about. But basically, the, um, the solar technology has actually been around for quite some time. And the reason that the last decade or so has seen popularity of solar energy and its installations is primarily cost. So as you were mentioning earlier, and that which you've covered in your solar um, um, cell class, are, is that it's really very uh, much a cost-driven industry. And you look at this kind of a dramatic change. You know, was there a change in physics that happened between 1980 and year 2000? No, there wasn't. It was just a matter of it's still a you know, a, a PN junction, a very simple device uh, from an electrical engineering perspective. This is not complicated. It's all about how do you deploy it and what volume is it being deployed in that can actually drive the cost down. And, um, and fortunately for us, we are now at the point that module prices are below a dollar. In fact, they're well below a dollar. So much of what you um, um, hear about where there's additional pressure for cost, certainly there is, you know, it's, 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 the, it's a commodity. And so there's a, um, you know, there's a continuous drive to excel. Um, but really, if you look at this curve, there's a lot that's been done regarding cost already. And we'll touch upon that um, throughout the presentation. But what, is, what happens when you have a dramatic increase in cost like this is that you've got, you, um, all of a sudden, a, a huge market. right? You drive down a very simple kind of you know, economics. Um, you drive down cost, and all of a sudden, demand goes up. Um, so what's happened is that um, in 2006, we had 1.5 gigawatts of solar. And um, you know, um, I guess five, uh, whatever the number of years that is. Nine, eight. eight years. Eight years later, um, we're looking at 52. Uh, and um, and you know, you look at other industries like nuclear. There's no, <laughs> there, there's no such growth like this. There's a huge installed base, and there's a lot of gigawatts of power that are generated using nuclear energy. But if you look at the growth over the last, you know, decade or so, there has not been this. Um, so this is a pretty unique uh, and very special situation. The US has been lagging behind um, of some of the other countries that were mentioned. Japan is a, was an early adopter, and then Germany really is one of the um, main places that gets credit for um, changing their policy to really um, drive the, the engine for cost reduction. But the U.S. actually, if you look in just like three years, it's, it has an amazing multiplier of how much um, you know interest and in installed energy there is in uh, for solar. Um, so, if you and, and you're staying a little bit with the U.S., um, California kind of leads the the charge here. Um, and there's a couple of states in there that might surprise you, New Jersey. Um, but it really is again comes down to policy. There was. Some governor there who established a policy to incentivize people, and you put the right incentives and reward systems in place, human beings line up right behind it. And so that's basically what you've seen. But uh, then some of the other ones are more, um, you know, uh, there's more logic just as far as how much sunshine there is. Hawaii, the cost of power is very expensive. And so you're kind of getting to grid parity um, is, uh, is easier there for solar. Um, and um, but anyway, this kind of gives you a little bit of a breakdown. What is that residential, like rooftop as well? This as is most, yeah. This is mostly um, as well as residential as well as yeah. It's the total installed. Mm -hmm. But this really is um, the story here. Um, there are in Silicon Valley, we're lucky enough to have had experiences of this kind of growth in other industries. But really, this is not something that you expect in your lifetime to be able to participate in. And so I find it very fortunate as a uh, technical person to have um, experienced this. Um, I entered the industry around 2006 timeframe. And so literally, the um, 
you know, there was a 10x multiplier in um, installed capacity. It, this is manufacturing capacity. And, um, and it really was um, an amazing experience to be um, involved. And, um, uh, and, but you know, this is, it, it's, this, is, this is not slowing down. Um, even though that over the last couple of years we've seen a lot of um, you know, fluctuation in the marketplace, if you just think about the value that solar energy brings to the energy portfolio that the world needs, it's, it's um, you know, the, the inherent value of it is really reflected here. Um, and no matter how in the near term people wonder, okay, you know, should I invest in these solar companies or should we put solar on our roof right now or next year or what will the policy be? There's a lot of like near term questions, but in the long run, everybody recognizes that solar is um, bringing real value to the energy needs that we have on, um, you know, across the world. And it's expected to be a, a trillion dollar industry by 2013. Okay, so um, Leslie mentioned, and I wanted to definitely give, you know, all of you are, are um, in early in your careers, and so I wanted to give you a little bit of an idea of what my experience has been and, uh, and the, you know, where um, and how roller, uh, solar energy has played a role. So I um, was born and bred actually in Berkeley as well, but um, I finished my PhD back in, uh, at the end of, um, the 90s. And at that time, you know, solar was definitely, you know, an area that some of my colleagues were studying. Um, I remember a couple, a couple of people in, um, you know, Professor Haller's group and um, Ike Weber's group, there would be silicon and people would talk about, you know, um, the conversion um, efficiencies. But still, it wasn't really, it was always seen as a technology that, you know, had this cost challenge. And, um, and so from a kind of an academic perspective, um, I, I chose to um, study nanotubes and, um, and you know, um, finished up my PhD and um, went straight into industry rather than pursuing an academic route, which is, I guess, more typical for physics. And my main um, reason to do that was because I, I liked the, um, the, the motivation to actually take technology and bring it to people to, to value in a product was personally more motivating to me than to kind of go deeper and deeper into doing um, research. And, um, and so, and I think this mentality actually plays well with solar energy because a lot of it is, it's not as much the basic science that you're learning, but really it's kind of how are you driving down the cost curve, how are you driving up the efficiency curve, that type of uh, a problem. Um, so I actually ended up um, joining Applied Materials, and um, it was a great time to be there because uh, the industry was moving from, a co from aluminum to copper, and so there were a lot of new projects. And I got I went from the world of um, resource constrained in grad school to lots of resources at your fingertips. And you know, as you ask for different chemicals or gases, by the time you get to the lab four hours later, there are, the gases are already hooked up and you can do whatever experiments you want. So it's a really great environment to, to get started on, a, on an industrial career. And then I joined Agilent, and that's where Leslie and I had a chance to meet and uh, work together. Um, and around 200, 2003 timeframe, um, uh, I had the um, opportunity to follow up on some of the research that I'd done in nanotechnology, and I wrote a business plan and founded um, a company to do electronics cooling using nanotubes. So this really kind of um, changed a lot of my technical focus to also having a business focus. And, um, and again, I think the environment around here in Silicon Valley is something that you really, I mean, I would encourage you all to take advantage of. It's not every place that you can, you know, go out there and anybody you run into in a coffee shop, you'll be able to have a conversation regarding some experience that they have related to a, uh, to a startup or a, um, a business plan or a, a new technology. And, you know, these, this is an environment that's very rich for that. Um, so, so I had the opportunity. It was, um, it was funded by top tier investors. We went through, we hired a team, we took the technology to where the materials were like world class. Um, but the implementation of the market was actually different than what we expected. And so I ended up um, uh, 
I had I had basically as part of the business plan had had uh, sold my patents to the investors and so they gave me back my patents and I end up returning part of the money. Um, most st startups don't end this way. Either they they will run out of money, but I st I actually stopped midway because time is more valuable than money. So once I knew there was a market risk, I didn't want to actually keep going and waste the time of the great team that I'd hired and or my investors or myself. And um, and that's where I was looking for a very interesting technology problem which had a business application and solar was really kind of in its prime at that point. Um, so I joined SunPower and there were 400 people when I joined and there were 4,000 people when I left. So it was just that, that 10x growth that you saw as far as the installed capacity, you experienced that on every level. And, um, and I can, speak more to some of the issues that you guys brought up, but kind of fast forwarding a little bit, um, I ended up um, uh, after a couple of years at SunPower being recruited into a startup that was doing gallium arsenide, which has the world record efficiency for, um, for single cell, um, single junction solar cells, and, um, and spent five years there until it was acquired um, in earlier this year, and then now I'm at Apple. So anyway, solar is, um, is definitely, um, and uh, I, it's, a, it's a fantastic field, and I encourage all of you to, you know, um, take advantage of this time that you have in, um, at Stanford to get connected to both classes as well as industry. Okay, so solar technology, um, you're pretty much familiar. It seems like everybody kind of has a background in it. You know, it's a panel. It's not very space efficient. <laughs> A light bulb like this will actually generate about the same wattage as a panel, um, but but on the other hand, um, once you've you've put the energy into making this panel, it'll continue to you know power up and um, and we um, the efficiency is where you've got over uh, at the approximately one square meter is about 100 to 200 watts depending on what kind of technology you're using. So, tech, you know, operation-wise, uh, solar cell is very simple. Like I mentioned, it's a you know a PN diode, and um, and basically the sun comes in, generates an electron hole pair. You put contacts on, um, and you generate a current. So not much you can do, but actually the whole point is that all you can do is you're just fighting physics for the losses. So everything you do in solar cell design in optimizing is basically you're trying to have less and less loss. You will have loss, but uh, the better you design your device and the more um, the more fine-tuned your manufacturing process, the the more efficient your solar cell will be. But your, you know, silicon, um, you know, the best you can get is gonna, is around thirty percent, even in a kind of a, you know. Uh, theoretical limit. So to the point of like, wait, you know, can't we do better? You know, there's so much power coming out of the sun. Well, from a solar uh, perspective, yes, you can, you can capture part of that, but you're always, you know, the, the amount that you capture, you should have your expectations um, within around the 30% range. And 20% is where the industry is at right now. Um, overall solar cell design, I think maybe you've covered a lot of this in some of your other classes, but you know um, what's important is that you do texturing so that the light that's come in, you try to get as much out of it as possible. Um, the, the beam will bounce multiple times, and so you can get more, um, you can generate more electron hole pairs. Um, so, 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 and this is how good is your text drink. So now there's a manufacturing process that you know certain set of certain companies have equipment and different chemistries. And if you buy this tool, you'll get this level of texturing. You buy another tool, you'll get another level of texturing. And how well that works with the rest of your solar cell design. It's there's a lot of research and effort that um, that the um, various um, you know that industry has already. Um, you know, tried to optimize substantially. Um, in fact, uh, the one of the um, okay. Well, let me, so so conventionally, you've got this. The, the the this is this slide is basically telling you what kind of losses you have. I covered this a little bit already. You've got a limit about thirty percent, and generally, you're looking at about a twenty percent efficient solar cell. Uh, I had the good fortune of working at um, SunPower, and this is where we had an all 
back contact solar cell design that actually came out of Stanford. And, um, and Dick Swanson founded the company actually, I think, 20 years ago or something like that. And it was only in the last, you know, um, decade or so that really um, with the policy changes um, around the world that it was really able to to grow the way that um, uh, it has. And there you've got a unique design where the front is now, um, there's no shadowing with um, electrical contacts. It's all in the back. It does require more sophisticated manufacturing. So there is an increase in the complexity, but um, at a net, what you're getting, and this is like all the math that you do for the energy that's harvested in um, on the top of a, a rooftop. So, given a certain square footage and how much power you can generate, you're really at a net positive with this technology. Um, and I guess in the question session, I'll I'll, um, I'll um, entertain specific questions rather than going more deeply into it at this point. So, the value chain. Um, the you know you start off with silicon and yes it costs a lot of energy to to generate the silicon. Um, on the other hand, the if you look at the semiconductor industry, they've already put a lot of effort into driving those costs down and getting really high quality silicon with the least amount of defects. And um, for solar, you actually don't need the kind of quality that you need for a lot of the semiconductor devices. So you're able to to grow. Um, you're able to change the growth processes to a certain extent to have more production. Um, and, um, and in fact, you know, the industry, if you recall in the first graph where you had the module prices went up a little bit, it was all because there was such an incredible demand from the solar and industry that the, the silicon industry didn't expect it. And so they were sitting here, you know, making their predictions based on semiconductor and then solar comes and kind of overwhelms it. And so there was a there was a uh, you know a jump in the silicon prices. Raw, uh, you know, um, silicon was going for five hundred dollars a kilogram for spot prices, which right now are more closer to the twenty five dollar mark. So it was it was quite some crazy times. Um, but the base of um, you know I, the the base technology. There's some improvements that people have tried to make in um, their single crystal silicon cells that can be made, but there's also polycrystalline. And the, the, um, the multi-crystalline cells, the bigger you can get your grain size, the better. And so there's quite a bit of effort that has been um, made on the, on the growth side to see if you can get higher quality, lower quality silicon. So increase the quality of the multi-crystalline. Uh, and then it's all about this processing. So that middle block that accounts for about 15% of, um, of the cost is really where a lot of effort is put and has been um, a driver for the volume. Something that doesn't really come up a lot in, um, in solar cell discussions is when you look at how this, this uh, cost curve, you know, what has really enabled it to be driven down so low? Personally, I feel like the credit should, um, a lot of credit should go to the equipment manufacturers. And um, of course, the researchers that have optimized the design, that's a really big, um, you know, the, they, they get um, a lot of the credit. But also, the equipment suppliers have really um, maintained the high performance of the processes that are coming out and yet scale the equipment to much larger um, you know, production volumes. So for example, you have a wet tool that used to run 1,000 wafers an hour at a certain cost. Now that same tool can run three to 4,000 wafers an hour, and it's just marginally a little bit more expensive. And the quality of the processes coming out of that are not that different. So, and, and now when somebody is, you know, you look at, the, you saw that growth from 1.5 gigawatts to, you know, 50 plus gigawatts of installed capacity. You know, you can't, that's a, you know, you would have to put in four tools for every one tool that they actually did end up putting in. So that kind of manufacturing equipment design um, is, uh, you know, is, um, gets a lot of credit in my mind. And, um, and you know, um, the semiconductor industry has, traditionally um, also been um, support, well supported by the equipment industry. And equipment, you know, it's tough business. It's, it, it's expensive to, um, 
to build equipment. Um, there's, um, there's, you know, it takes time. So you can't like, it's not like, you know, six, like one month and you get a new product and you, you know, sell it. It's like it takes six months to build this stuff. Um, and, um, and, you know, you get profit. But on the other hand, with, and I mean, if you're, if you're serving an industry that is very cost sensitive, you know, we were negotiating some very, um, you know, um, very good prices. So the, the equipment guys were not making the kind of margin that the semiconductor equipment people were making. So, um, and in fact, when the market went down, they they suffered a lot. There's many of those, you know, fantastic companies that have really been um, struggling to survive this downturn. So, you know, that's that's part of the um, the the story of if you've got something so dynamic. Um, then panel making is when you've actually got the solar cell. It's you know um, individually, it's got the electrical contacts on it, but now you need to put it in um, series onto a panel. And there's a substantial cost that goes into that. And that's also a place where people have made um, you know good progress in driving down you know exactly how much um, ribbon you really need and what's the best ways of putting it together so you have the least amount of losses. Um, and then if you look at that downstream, it's like a huge amount of cost goes into, and I think somebody mentioned here, you know, the, um, the installation and the inverters and a lot of the rest of the, um, the system. Um, and there, I think it's also regional. Um, and, um, and again, as you've got companies like SolarCity, um, they, you know, they're optimizing this, you know, more and more by having people who can um, come out to homes and very quickly show the value proposition. It used to be that it was hard. You know, you're kind of like, okay, do I do, should I install solar or should I not install solar? How am I going to fund it? You know, all these type of questions come into this. And the models for doing that have gotten much more sophisticated over the last few years, which has, you know, supported the growth of the market. But overall, it's all about kind of cost per watt. Um, and earlier it used to just be dollars per watt, and now people are getting a little bit smarter and kind of, you know, are looking at dollars per kilowatt hour. And, um, and so, um, you know, it's, uh, and that, that's, you know, it's obviously more accurate to, to see the actual energy that's harvested. Um, so that's, that kind of applies to, um, mostly to the silicon industry, but I also want to point out that there's thin film and, um, uh, so thin film has been also a very um, interesting story where it's always been a smaller portion of the market, but there's been a couple of companies that have really made substantial progress and it's really been a simpler manufacturing um, you know, uh, flow and um, that has enabled this. So even though it's less efficient from a panel level, it's actually more cost effective because your manufacturing processes are really straightforward. You don't start off with silicon, you just start off with glass. Well, guess what? You were gonna take your solar cells and, and, and you know um, sandwich them into pieces of glass anyway, so why not just have the glass? So these kind of um, you know, uh, differences make thin film also um, quite compelling. Amorphous silicon, um, there, you know, that's a technology that um, has been out there, has been struggling, and in fact, um, maybe not so popular these days. Most of those lines are shut down. SIGS is an area I'll, I'll talk about a little in a little bit where this area specifically, um, Silicon Valley, had a lot of startups working in this space. CADTEL has been the most successful, which has been um, for solar predominantly. Um, and then um, I mentioned the startup that I was in, this was um, Alta Devices, and we worked on a gallium arsenide. Yeah, this is fascinating technology because every kind of buzzword you thought of in silicon, and in, in solar industry, um, high efficiency, it has it. Flexible, it has it. Thin film, it has it. Cost effective, it has it. You know, it's, you, it was a little bit like, wait, is this for real? And then, you know, you spend five years on it, and yes, it is for real. <laughs> um, so, so anyway, but generally, the market still is heavily biased towards silicon. Sure. Yes, it shows up on both sides because um, uh, the space cells are also gallium arsenide. So all of your, you know, um, uh, systems out in, um, you know, um, all satellites and stuff—they're all powered by gallium. Pardon me? I worked on space station solar array and I oversaw the production of these cells. Is that right? Okay, yeah. So, but the government and everything that goes into space is 
ridiculously more expensive. I can't even tell you how many ingots we threw away because they suspected they might have flaws. Is they didn't right? know for sure. And then when they grew the crystals, they couldn't explain why they had to throw something away. They said, we just think it's wrong. We're, we're throwing it away. But they had the money. Yeah. I mean, that's just that's a, that's um, an area where there's no cost sensitivity. So it's or yeah, yeah that's right. It's, it, yeah, the, the, the in the limits, the cost. right? The repairman, that's a long way. To go. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So you just basically, it's kind of a no risk mentality. Well, the whole program can go away if you have a minor <laughs> failure that makes it into the public domain. So, you know, or 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 the following, they're like, oh, well, you guys had a problem. We're gonna we're gonna cut your funding off. We're gonna go fund something else. And, you know, um, a simple number, if you want to keep in mind, is a gallium arsenide wafer um, is about $150, and a silicon wafer is about $4. <laughs> so um, that's partially, you know, um, but it has the highest efficiency. And so if you're up in space, you want to get the most out of, you know, whatever sun you're going to collect. So it shows up both places. Okay. Um, so the next day, you know, so we kind of talked a little bit about um, the technology. This next um, set of slides is really kind of more in the application domain and some that are currently, you know, um, emerging and others that are maybe more future term, but it gives you the possibilities of what solar energy can, act, can do um, in these different fields. So this is the the traditional market here is residential, um, power plants, um, and commercial. So commercial is basically you've got Target and it's got you know solar cells on it. Well, it's really great actually because they cut down their peak power. You can't have the whole power of the you know the plant be run by solar, but you can cut down the peak power and it makes a tremendous difference from a cost perspective. Facilities people love it. Um, power plants, you know, this is where you take a big open field and usually it's out in the middle of the desert because it's the most, um, the, the best um, return for energy harvesting. And, uh, but you're kind of far away and so you still have all the transmission losses. Residential is great because, you know, you generate it and you use it. So you've, you're really kind of minimizing the loss in the system. You already have the losses from the solar cell. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so this is a very compelling um, value proposition. And particularly if you look at other parts of the world where you don't have an established grid, well, this is, this is a ready, set um, solution. What has really been, um, you know, uh, of interest to people and more and more people as um, in, the, in the, over the last few years is really the portable market. And there has always been some technology like amorphous silicon that you can you can build solar cells on um, flexible substrates. The problem, though, is that you need to have like a huge, um, you know. Uh, piece of material in order to get some substantial power. So all of a sudden, the portability is there, okay, so you can, you know, it's flexible. But on the other hand, in, if you really want some substantial power, you really need to be lugging around quite a volume of material. Um, but with the gallium arsenide um, solar cells that I was talking about, all of a sudden that value proposition changes substantially. And um, with some of the SIGS application, uh, you know, technologies as well, um, this application becomes more compelling. So I want to spend a little bit of time on this. Um, so the mobile power application. Um, first of all, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, technologies, we, we see this all over and over again with um, the, the military and the applications aren't the, the early ap early adopters are often, um, you know, uh, in this in this military space. And in the case of uh, UAVs, if you just have the battery, you have about an hour that this um, the the uh, unmanned um, vehicle can move around. If you put solar on it, all of a sudden it can recharge, and you've got a substantial um, value proposition here. Uh, so so this is kind of a, a near term. And if you look at the cost. Um, it's it's a you know it's a it's a big payback. Right, and again, the budgets are more elastic. Uh, you can also 
have them not just in um, the air, but on the water. And you know, you think about remote, play, you know, remote places. How are you even going to think about getting power out there? Well, solar, you know, the sun's pretty much everywhere, and so you can see that you'd get power. So I know that USGS, right? We wouldn't have any weather monitoring on the ocean if it wasn't for solar. And most of the, the large buoys off San Francisco are all solar. And they've been that way for probably our whole life, almost. Yeah. And that's what's, the table out there. Yeah. And that, that's, what's so, yeah, that's what's so you know interesting about solar energy. I mean, it's this, the, this material and the technology has been around. It's just a matter of deployment. And that's why it's a. That's why I found it to be a really great and very satisfying area to have um, worked in. Because, you know, each time, each notch, you can drive the cost down. All of a sudden, more, more, more and more markets open up. Um, more, you know, um, odd ideas. Um, even in space, so you know this is the, um, the gallium arsenide. But now, if you talk, if you think about flexible, and you can wrap it around, um, then there's another value proposition there. There's obviously, you know, and this is. I think this picture gives you, you know, that this these set of images kind of shows you how broad, um, you know, the the application can be. Um, and then you think about it out in the middle of the desert. How are you going to get some? get power and you've got your devices, everyone is hooked up pretty much. Um, well, you know, even with some solar on the back of this, you're going to end up getting some power continuous. Um, then there are, you know, uh, you get into more and more niche markets, I guess. But again, like I said, this is kind of more for, you know, the, the creative um, spirit and just seeing where, I mean, power itself is ubiquitous. And um, and solar really, you know, can play a, a potentially um, large role in making this a reality. So just industrial wise too, you've got sensors. Um, this one is actually this is pretty interesting. If you um, took took the Alta devices solar cells and put it on an iPad, the lar the size is large enough that you actually can get the same rate of charge as if you plugged in the wall. So all of a sudden now that you know, value proposition starts becoming, you know, more compelling. And it is diff driven by, obviously, the efficiencies. Um, there's um, more. You can actually, I think this is still live. You can go to the Alta Devices um, website and see that, you know, for some of these consumable devices, w depending on the kind of usage you have, you can really extend your battery life, you know, substantially. So, you know, I think the way we use devices changes. I mean, we, these devices didn't even exist for you know a short while ago, and um, and now it's all a matter of trying to address the user's needs. And um, and you know, I think solar has a play. Some of you asked about the um, transportation and the role that solar plays. You know, unfortunately, the amount of energy it generates is still pretty small compared to the rooftop area that is available in a car. On the other hand, um, you can definitely. Um, uh, you can um, uh, you can substantiate the power, and so um, you're draining the battery less. So when the car is just parked, you can have um, you know conditioning of the environment. So places like Arizona, where, where you know the car gets very hot, um, you can you know if you have solar on your rooftop, it can easily be running a fan, and um, and you know taking care of the environment. Uh, otherwise, you have an electric vehicle, and now you're draining the battery to you know to 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 run cooling so the battery stays, you know, cool enough. So um, solar has a value proposition there. Um, in areas that you've got more rooftop, you can do more, potentially help with uh, transportation where you're, where you're moving goods that need, um, you know, temperature control like refrigeration. It can help um, alleviate the drain on the, um, the rest of the, um, the power systems. Um, so that kind of gives you, I mean, most of these are really not in, um, they're all kind of in nascent stages, and it remains to be seen how they really get implemented and developed. And it really does take a lot of times, a, a, you know, individuals that are going to champion a cause and really believe that, hey, we can make this work, and then they optimize for that particular niche application. And then, you know, before you know it, that niche application starts becoming more and more um, popular, and all of a sudden you can kind of generate an industry. I would say some of these are um, are opportunities for that kind of um, work to happen. But when you get into um, 
you know, solar manufacturers and what's been happening, I want to talk a little bit about kind of the, 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 the work in the field. And, um, you know, the venture community um, right now, solar and clean tech is not very popular. But a couple of years ago, it was very, very, very popular. And the, the uh, VCs put $6 billion into this um, space. And um, basically with zero return. So this was not a very happy investment story. Um, but it was a, it, it kind of shows you that there was a lot of promise and there was a lot of enthusiasm because there was a lot of action. There were a lot of startups that had new ideas and new ways of putting down, you know, SIGs and you can you can plate it and you can co-evaporate it and you can sputter it and you can you know there's there you know from a techno from a technical perspective there's a lot of things to um, to find out to explore and um, and there seemed to be a value that you could um, extract from it from with it cost or simplification of manufacturing processes cheaper equipment you know all sorts you know whole array of things and people were very actively investing in them um, so just a scant few years ago um, there was a huge demand for um, for engineers in um, you know contributing to the, the solar space um, Unfortunately, the, um, the startups in this area have not really had the kind of experience that some of the other, um, you know, the dot-com industry, for example, um, has experienced. But, um, but still, I would say, I think one thing that, that this table may not show is that there was a lot of great training that happened. There was a lot of technology, um, uh, you know, progress. Um, there was a lot of... Um, know-how that was generated, there's a lot more, you know, there's an educated population that knows what it takes to make solar work. And I think, you know, the $6 billion that the VCs put in there was not, you know, it was actually, there, there was a, not a financial return directly, but there was actually um, another substantial return, which I think will play um, in the future to, to make um, alternative energy um, valuable. Most of the, I don't know if many of you may have seen this, but most, you know, the challenge, and this is kind of more for a startup um, perspective, but the challenge is really that um, chasm here that you see um, where you're really trying to, you take an idea, you foster it through various um, prototypes, and you even get a pilot line, and most of those companies had pilot lines here locally, but then now you have to bridge this gap, and it takes substantial funding to bridge that gap. Um, and then once you're across that, then you can actually self-sustain. But you need this, and um, and you know, uh, solar technology—it's it's a hardware. I mean, you need to buy equipment. You need to have facilities that you know space. So this is you know it's capital intensive, and um, and so there was not the appetite in many cases to cross that chasm. So, pardon me. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, what has happened is basically a lot of the um, the larger companies are the ones that um, survived. It was difficult for smaller companies with their new ideas to kind of maintain, um, you know, business, um, keep the doors open. But even with the big companies, this is okay. And if you look at this chart, um, this is just over, you know, less than five years. And look at how dynamic this industry is. And this is what, for me personally, it's very exciting. Um, but you see here that um, that you've got, um, in some senses, same cast of characters. But it's not like Intel and you know over and over the same thing that you see. This is really, um, you know, it changes. Um, you know, the the, the fortunes change. Um, you know, quite dramatically. And um, and in fact, if I had you know, even earlier than this, BP Solar and Shell Solar and some of these people were kind of, you know, Leader Sharp was a huge, had the largest installed um, manufacturing capacity for a very, very long time. And then all of a sudden, boom, things changed and, you know, Sharp still, had, you know, got dropped down substantially and then came back up. And it's really been fascinating to watch some of these, um, uh, these players. But one thing you notice with the set of names is that um, definitely the solar manufacturing has been, um, you know, takes place in a particular region of the world. And, um, and I think here we have to uh, recognize that 
the Chinese government has been um, committed to making solar a reality. And, um, and this is what happens when a government says, we do want to do this. They make capital available. It's, it's very popular. I mean, we would go to shows and you could you know, have 100,000 people coming to a solar show. And, um, and, um, and you know, everybody's excited about um, doing renewable. And, um, and very quickly, the industry um, has really shifted. Um, and you know, I think the other areas, um, there's potential hope that they can also have um, a government policy that can encourage um, manufacturing. But on the other hand, with the pressures that you have in cost, you really have to be um, very selective about what projects you choose to do and not do. So how does that work? For instance, in China, is it individual consumers or businesses, or is it the government buying these installations for cities? How, how, is, how does that go? So um, basically, first of all, there was uh, anybody who um, wanted to set up a solar manufacturing plant was provided with capital to get started. Ooh. So yeah, so you basically, you know, you like literally here in the in the venture community, it was kind, it's kind of like when I wrote my business plan and I shopped it around and said, hey, um, I'd like to to do, you know, I'd like to use carbon nanotubes and cool electronics. It's like, oh, that sounds like a good project. Okay, so uh, and now here it's like, hey, look, I, I've got, you know, um, I, here's my plan to, you know, rent this space and buy this equipment and I'm going to produce, you know, um, half a gigawatt of solar in one year. It's like, okay, that sounds like a good thing. So there is capital available for them to do that. And that basically you had overnight hundreds of companies. Um, and they bought equipment. So the equipment industry, um, you know, had a very steep um, uh, revenue increase. And, um, and there was very close collaboration. And most of this equipment is actually made in Europe and, you know, some in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So there's very close collaboration between the Chinese manufacturers and the European equipment manufacturers, which enabled, like I mentioned, they really get a lot of credit for making this industry happen. They enabled this largely. Um, and then the market was actually back in either the U.S. and Europe, and so things were sold back. Ah. Um, and now there's local markets that are developing. And so, yeah, now there is governments. So now The government now is focusing on incentivizing the installation of solar, but earlier they were in, um, oh. incentivizing the production of it. Hmm. And the US, um, you know, has kind of never really figured out exactly what the policy they want is, and, um, and it shows. I mean, this chart directly shows what governments kind of understood what the opportunity space was here and which ones didn't. Hmm. Okay. Um, looking forward, if you look at kind of the um, you know, where, and some of you brought this up with, you know, off-grid and, you know, where the solar has its um, value. You notice here that um, the prediction is certainly that residential, where you can get the maximum value because you're generating power right where you're using it, it is a very compelling value proposition mm -hmm. and, um, and a great way to kind of get to grid parity. Um, but, um, and again, like I, I mentioned earlier, you look at this and, you notice that nobody is doubting the fact that, you know, is solar something that's, you know, um, that's, that happened and, you know, and it was like a blip of hit in history? It's like, no. This is something that it's a technology that has shown um, its value. Um, it's, uh, it's dramatically gone down the cost curve. There's still some room to go, but, you know, it gets harder and harder every year. Um, and, um, but there's more and more to be done on in, the, um, in the market and kind of being able to finance it and get it to uh, different areas um, of the world where, um, where it's valued. Sure. Uh, looking at this chart and seeing that residential is such a high percentage and also knowing that you know, solar generates DC electricity, but also a lot of the electronics we use require DC energy yeah. and we're converting it the DC to AC and then the AC back to DC. It, do you foresee a place now where we're building new homes, new buildings that we're actually going to install DC wiring? We can put solar directly up to it to minimize those losses, or is that then too complicated to then plug back into the so grid, which is AC? With superconductors. Huh? And, and that may never be affordable. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, this is an area that people, um, you know, when we're, we're, we're working super hard to get like 0.05 or 0.03% efficiency, um, you know, people are going to bring up, hey, well, if you just converted it, you know, uh, differently, you'd get a whole lot more efficiency than all of this research and all these millions of dollars you're putting in here. Um, but that's always, it, there's really, um, uh, it's kind of a TBD. Nobody, everybody recognizes that there's a value to it, but nobody really sees how people are going to actually implement that. Um, you know, I personally think that there are um, the the financing of this um, is um, a near term um, it, a near term value. Um, then actually, can imagine the infrastructure that you have to change. Not, not that it's not possible, but it's a pretty high bar. So I have a feeling that there's many other things that are going to happen, and then potentially one can always see this as a benefit as well. But probably we'll be able to um, garner, you know, advantage um, for efficiency and cost in other ways. Inverter, I mean, there's a lot of work on microinverters now where you're selectively looking at panels and optimizing that, um, the kind of the string of, um, of uh, the, the solar installation rather than, you know, <laughs> plugging it all into one inverter. Um, so, so, yeah. It's a matter of when, and this one is almost ma also a matter of if. Could also be location dependent. A place where you don't have any kind of a grid, maybe there's a different value proposition mm -hmm. that comes into play there. Okay. And um, you know, the other thing that I think people should keep in mind, and this is this is uh, a chart that shows the different energies. And I know many of you kind of brought this up as well. Um, solar is a very, 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 very small fraction of the um, energy mix at the moment. But you know, a lot of these other energies. They also had a lot of policy help and a lot of support from, pardon me? Yeah. I worked in oil. Right. Okay, so here's the basic formula, right? I mean, we like to, we can throw spears in China for the policy that they have that has wiped out the rest of the world's solar production. And that was intentional. That's what the Chinese wanted to do. Now they're in a situation where they have to shut down the less efficient companies in order to raise the price again, right? Um, and if those, some of those companies were located in the United States, you know, we would love it because they're actually doing pretty well. In the oil industry, if I invest $100,000 in oil well, I can get 100% of that money back in five years. In fact, currently, I can get 70 to 80% of that back in taxes. In the first year, right, I can do a line item write-off, mm -hmm. right? There is, what else can you do in the world that does that other than me, you know, I don't know. <laughs> You know, but but I mean that's 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 not even investment. That's just that's that, that's a loan. Okay, so even if I give you a hundred million dollars for your company, and you go bankrupt, I still get all of my money back. Where's the risk there? Yeah. But we need a comprehensive energy policy that allows that to happen. And I think part of it is also people don't recognize that a lot of these other um, industries, you know. That, this, that is what's happening. You do get a lot of support. So, you know, when you look at solar, um, you know, subsidies, people are like, oh, you're subsidizing and subsidizing. And it's like, well, actually, we can even get to subsidy free depending on what region and how expensive the, you know, the grid power is in that area. But, but really, if you, if you want to look at the whole net value, all of a sudden, you know, solar is much more compelling than it, um, you know, even for the non-believers. Um, but I do think that this is something that we have to, you know, it, it really, I mean, it's, um, it's, a, it's, it's a decision. You know, this is not something that, um, it's something that we have not decided, and I completely agree with you. A lot of people can be critical of the Chinese government for incentivizing and, uh, and dropping the prices that low, and yes, it was partially by design, but the point is it did, it did um, grow, the, the, the decrease in prices has really enabled a much broader market. Right? And that's exactly what we've always wanted in solar. So solar, the whole value proposition was to get more and more solar, and we have seen that. That has definitely been delivered. I mean, in my opinion, if we didn't have the investment environment that we have for oil, we wouldn't have any fracking in the country because of the risks right. at all. Yeah. It wouldn't exist. But look where it's gotten us. Yeah. And there's, of course, there is risk there. But it's, as you said, the investment. And then it's the government, right? It's not, the free market doesn't do everything. Yeah. Unfortunately. 
So then, do people in the solar industry foresee the costs going actually increasing over the next few years if China or other decides to, like you said, shut down some of the less efficient companies? It's already happening. So, um, and will the costs continue to decrease because of other advances in manufacturing and technology and other things? Yeah. So, um, you know, right now, if you look at the cost of the solar cell, it's um, it's about fifty cents. Okay, and, um, and it, you know, it used to be fifty dollars or something. Um, and if that's you know it, that that's pretty optimized, and you know, you're really looking at you know, how little solar, uh, how little silver can you put on this, and you know, how thin can you make the silicon, and you know, we went from two hundred microns. Actually, 250 microns of um, silicon now down to like 180 microns. So you're really trying to get more and more wafers out of each ingot, etc. I find it really hard to see how you can drive it less than 45 cents. You know that kind. Of, I mean, I really think you're kind of you're reaching these asymptote for cost for manufacturing. On the other hand, I think for like the installations. And for the rest of the value proposition, I think there's a lot of room in there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you're going to, um, you know, with more and more creativity on that front, I think you're going to see deployment. And then also you look at these niche markets. I mean, they look very niche and they look kind of like, hmm. But, you know, something like this could really take off. And all of a sudden, there's another, there, you know, that, that um, you know, motivates, um, you know, manufacturing capacity in a different technology. So I think a lot of, you know, some of those things can certainly happen. I don't see the cost of solar cells going up. I mean, maybe, you know, the usual kind of up and down thing, but I don't, I, I think it's, it's fairly stable. Um, and yes, they drop down dramatically, and there is a lot of people in the industry who talk about how they were, you know, kind of fakely low. I mean, it wasn't a real price. Um, but, you know, there are even outside of, um, you know, China where, you know, you've got very clean records of how business is done. You can reach to, you know, the 50 cent mark for manufacturing of solar cells. So just that one section um, that I was talking about. Yes? So in the coming future, how, how competitive do you think the U.S. market of solar cells manufacturing is against the Chinese market? Like, do you think in the next 10 years all the manufacturing is going to go to China? as it's happened in a lot of industries, and it's, it's going to remain kind of spread around. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like, what, what's actually, you know, if, if you want to work in solar cells in 10 years from here, do you have to move to China? Or can you stay here? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's yeah, it's a great, great question. And, you know, um, um, it, it, it turns into a philosophical question rather than a factual question, really. So here I'll share my own personal philosophy on it. If you'd like to, you know, um, hear that. Um, I think that the um, that there is value in doing local manufacturing, and I think that if we really looked at the costs, we would find that there's sufficient scale, there's sufficient automation that you can have, you know, solar manufacturing plants in places that are considered to be expensive for manufacturing. Yeah, they may not be the absolute cheapest, but if you look at the net net where you're installing it nearby so that the, the, you know, the transportation cost for your end product, because this is bulky stuff. I mean, you're, this is not like, um, you know, we have to like be shipping um, wafers and glass and steel and all this kind of stuff. And so I think if you look at that, there is a case to be made that the, you know, the, the economics would support doing local production. Um, it's, it is debated in the industry. Um, and, um, and, you know, some of the U.S., um, you know, um, companies started off doing manufacturing here and then were kind of moved um, to offshore. But I think part of that is also just to capture the market and take advantage. You know, you go to um, an another country and guess what? You get a break on the power. You get a break on the water. You get a break on all these things, right? You can go to another state. And the government, so, you know, governments have to, to also decide how, what they would like to have happen in their, their states or their regions. And, um, and you know, you don't, know, you don't only go to Asia because you can get the cheap labor there. You also go there because the, um, the environment that that country, um, you know, provides you is competitive. So, so I think, yeah. 
or if it is it less Not restrictive. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so, so for example, you can, um, and there are places where power, I mean, because it does take power to make solar cells, like you, we were talking about earlier. Um, the net, net, and it depends on which technology, but, um, and it's a very hard analysis to do, but basically the, the, what the industry is really trying to, um, to um, fine tune is the power that goes into making the solar cell, how long is the payback period for when it actually generates the power that it took to make itself. And it's typically, um, you know, two to three years, depending on the technology. And that's from, like, from beginning to end. But then after that three years, it's all, you know, you're in kind of all plus regime. But suppose it is on that order, then, you know, you can, the if your power, you know, power in um, it, across the U.S. is different, right? I think New York is maybe you know, four or five cents you can get. Um, and uh, California is like 14. <laughs> um, that, if, and power is a big, for, is a substantial um, uh, cost of your overall co um, solar cell manufacturing. And so, um, so these type of things, I think if you look at them, um, my feeling is that there's a case to be made that you can do regional manufacturing. And it's not just in solar. I think that that you can do in other places as well. It's really the, the whole thing, whole cheaper labor. It's like, you know, it's really not about, but personally, I don't think it's about labor. Um, you know, it's about, um, it's about incentivizing the right behavior of the uh, industry. You put on um, Malaysia was one of the main producers of solar yes. cells. I'm assuming it's foreign companies that go to Malaysia to manufacture, right? That's exactly what happened. It's not the technology. Like China, well, they have a lot of um, Chinese companies that are making solar cells. I'm assuming a lot of foreign companies also do it, but it's mainly Chinese companies, right? That's right, right. That's so Malaysia was actually quite um, recognized the opportunity that solar had, um, or that the, the solar industry had, and they attracted. Um, you know, specifically for solar, they attracted Q cells, they attracted sun power. Sun power has a huge facility. Um, they're um, you know, um, in Malaysia. Um, First Solar has a huge plant. Um, Q Cells, which is now um, Hanwha, um, has a, a plant there. So, and then again, you know, Malaysia is, um, of power is not as expensive as it is in, say, Singapore. Um, so there were good reasons for those companies to be able to go there. And the Malaysian government, you know, recognized, hey, this is an opportunity. Let's work out the incentives to to um, attract the companies here, rather than they would go somewhere else. Yeah, but they're buying. I mean, they should say they burn wood to, to make their own energy. <laughs> yeah. And they're making solar cells, and then all the gas, all the fuck goes to Singapore, actually. So what's <laughs> fair there, you know? Yeah. Yeah, you're getting into kind of um, <laughs> you know, world politics here, which is, uh, you know. And we're also uh, outside the scope. Into overtime, too. Oh, OK, yeah. Um, but uh, well, so any other questions that maybe I mean, I'm happy to stay after class as well, but um, but are you able to come back the final week for the alumni, you know, all speakers and alumni reunion too? Sure, sure. Oh, yeah, that would I'm be happy lovely. To do that so too. Yeah, yeah. More discussions then too. Okay. Yeah. No, I think it's very exciting for me personally to um, to come to you know um, to a classroom and recognize that like people are so well versed in solar energy already um, and. Um, and, you know, I think that it's a very satisfying area to be part of. I mean, think about being a technologist or engineer, um, contributing to an industry that has, um, you know, a technology, uh, you can contribute from a technology perspective, has a very exciting market, and can, can make a very big impact of, in the world. And yeah. not just in, you know, the developed world or the, the, you know, developing countries. It's like all over the world. And um, there's not a lot of industries that actually have all those um, parameters. And um, so, so I think it's, um, you know, for those of you trying to figure out what you want to do and where you want to spend your time, I would highly encourage you to look at this. Phenomenal. Sorry, Thank you, Nisreen. <coughs> Um, different. Yeah, so not through Apple. Um, you know, in um, in Apple, my focus is basically on strategic deals. So you know, th there may be, um, but it's, it's not really as much solar. And um, and but I follow the industry, um, you know, uh, closely. And um, 
And I do think that even that industry and the people who contribute to that industry, I think there is a case to be made where you diversify and you don't just do solar. Maybe you do a little bit of other things too. Like for example, the equipment manufacturers, you know, some of these were, they were doing medical and solar and um, semiconductor and then solar hit them so hard that they started dropping off the others. And now they're like, oh my gosh, what happened to that medical business I had there? Maybe I should start that up, right? I mean, so I think, I think from that perspective, there's an opportunity of you know where I am right now to support the industry in kind of a you know um, in a different angle. Ms. Reen, thank okay. you. This was wonderful. No, thank you. Oh, actually, I forgot. I had a little quiz here. In fact, ah, um, perfect. Yeah, there was a basically just um, you know a quick number. I'm a I you know I studied physics, so I love numbers. And kind of some quick takeaways um, here. Um, so the answer is the next page. Maybe I'll just switch to that. But basically, efficiencies, you know, 10 for thin film, 20 for um, crystalline. It's kind of roundabout. Um, 60 gigawatts almost of installed capacity. 52 gigawatts of demand. 6.5 in the US itself. And um, a trillion dollar industry. So some good money to be made. Thank you.